Um, many times, you know, we'll talk to patients and they'll say, oh yeah, I was told I had something in the past. It was a spot or a freckle. And it, we may not be able to track down those old photos, but a picture is worth a thousand words. And in the setting of um, ocular melanoma, maybe 10,000 words. Um, so having some proof um, of what it looked like can really help the clinician um, if something changed. And, you, and that's portable. You can carry it with you on your phone. That's, that's a great point. And even, well, what we do at Oxford Eye Hospital is give every single patient a printout of their fundus photograph because they might go from one optometrist to another and so they can take it with them wherever they go. A question from the audience. Are there questions that I should ask my optometrist uh, that would be helpful for preventative measures? Brian? So for prevention of uveal melanoma, I'm not sure if we know of anything that's uh, been proven to really prevent uveal melanoma, even the sense of suspicious nevi. Um, I think that the, the UV influence, as we know, is probably very minimal, if any, uh, to, the UV, to the choroid because of the filtration of the normal anatomic structures. Um, so I think, in general, prevention doesn't really play into diet or environmental uh, behavioral modifications as it does with some other cancers. Uh, unless, Bertel, you know of anything else that might be useful besides eating healthy and exercising? And well, excessive sunlight does cause uh, skin cancers around the eye and conjunctival carcinomas. There's some evidence that it causes iris melanomas too, very rarely, these are extremely rare. But so eye protection from excessive sunlight is useful not for choroidal melanomas, but for other tumors. Well, it's good for everything really in the ocular. Okay. You know, and number one is something as simple as basal cell carcinoma, which is 1% uh, of all humans get that. So you could do a big service uh, to yourself by you know, wearing a hat and sunglasses when you're out for long periods of time. What else? Do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, there's uh, another one from the audience. Um, uh, is there a specific standard of eye protection in sunglasses that's recommended? Um, Brian, I bought a pair of uh, glasses on the streets of New York City for uh, $3.99 the other day. Um, are those good enough to protect me from all of these cancers you're talking about? Or what should I be asking my optician? Well. I think that we are lucky that uh, most plastics and UV protection is very inexpensive and can be incorporated into a multitude of freely available uh, products. And sometimes it might even have a little sticker on them. Even if you buy them on the streets of New York City, that say 99.96% UV protective. So I think that the expense of saying, oh, I'm gonna buy the best super deluxe, uh, you know, Ray-Ban sunglasses for my protection, uh, well, you don't have to do that. The, a lot of the protection is built into the plastics and to the, the coatings um, that are in normal uh, shaded transparent material. So UVA and UVB protection is what you're um, recommending? Yeah, I think that that is good. And even regular polycarbonate clear lenses block a percentage of UV light Bertel, you don't know offhand the percentage of normal polycarbonate blockage offhand, but it's no, I don't. No, I don't. But I'd like to emphasize how important it is for patients to wear those glasses if they've had uh, loss of vision in one eye to protect the healthy eye from injury. Right. Fair enough. We have some uh, really juicy questions coming in from the audience. I encourage everyone to keep um, their questions coming. So let's start with this one. Um, we talked about environment, maybe diet as well, Brian. So one question, does sugar feed ocular melanoma? So if I have a sweet tooth, does that make my melanoma grow faster or more likely to develop one? Well, I'd have to say that sugar feeds everything in every human being. Uh, and that's the way our cells metabolize. And unfortunately, cancer cells metabolize uh, 
uh, faster. And there's been things in the literature talking about modification of, of uh, diets to prevent cancer growth. However, with uveal melanoma and with the bioavailability of free glucose in the system, I think that depriving yourself from sweets is not going to have a, a major outcome on the growth rate of your tumor compared to the rest of your body. Uh, uh, Professor D'Amato, here's a, um, uh, another question and changes gear a little bit. So um, I am 10 years out, say 11 years out from my diagnosis and treatment for uveal melanoma. Um, it is now year 11 and um, the question comes, do I need to repeat my metastatic screening that I've been doing diligently for 10 years and they've always been clear, do I need to do it at year 11 and beyond? What is your recommendation and how do you parse that out? I have always delegated these decisions to the medical oncologist looking after my patients. And I know that many other ocular oncologists don't do that. They, they make decisions themselves. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that um, ionizing radiation is cumulative. The effects of ionizing radiation. So things like CT scans and and PET scans, if they're repeated year after year after year, that's, that's not very healthy. So if scans are continued beyond uh, 10 years, then, uh, or, or at any time, if ionizing radiation can be avoided by MRI or whatever, then that's much better, I think. So I'm going to um, uh, probe a little further. So um, sometimes, you know, we're all fortunate at our centers to have uh, real experts in melanoma. Uh, medical oncologists that specialize in melanoma and even metastatic ocular melanoma. But many folks will work with either their internist or their uh, primary general oncologist who may or may not have the specificity for ocular melanoma. And sometimes I'll get referred back from the patient saying, my doctor says I don't need to have scans after five years or after 10 years. So um, we'll come back to the professor, uh, Brian, our other professor, how do you tackle that? And what is your answer for after 10 years first? Okay, so if you look at statistics, um, and you can use a little bit of science to help guide your decisions, but some of them are subjective. Uh, after five years, the, the, the chance of your um, tumor being found as a metastasis goes down 66% or so, right? About two thirds of risk is within the first five years. And then that slowly has an asymptotic curve, meaning that it goes down, but not to zero uh, throughout the rest of, the, of your life. And by 10 years, it goes down to the around the single digit percentages, uh, usually one to 3% after that. But we know that certain metastatic patterns are different with different mutations. And as Dr. Harbour has talked about, um, there's different signatures between like a class two, which is more likely to be within the first five years versus a class 1B, which may be in the later years. Uh, and so maybe screening for those type of patients may be better. Now, if you have an iris melanoma, you're 10 years out. I think that yet yeah, maybe if you discuss it and know the risks and benefits to stop testing, then I think it's if you and your physician are comfortable with that, it's good. I'm lucky to have a great ocular or a medical oncologist, Dr. Carbajal, to kind of help us with that. But we've thought about it in some ways. And so what I do with my patients, let's say if I have a class 1B that's 10 years out, I'll either, you know, depending on their coverage, because, you know, after a certain period of time, the insurance companies will say, okay, you, you can get your scans, but the patients are going to have to cover that. And then the patient says, well, this MRI that's too dollars to four thousand dollars well doc it's been 10 years maybe i'm not going to do that versus subjecting them to more ionizing radiation which they will cover which i'm not really happy about because of the low risk as dr damato said i would switch them to an ultrasound and sometimes those are covered and that would be kind of a supplemental screen past the 10 years for people that want to continue surveillance or for people that have maybe a, a little bit of a remote risk of distant or time frame distance metastatic disease as in the class 1Bs. Um, so I think that that's kind of the way I approach the problem. 
And uh, I don't think there's a perfect answer. But I think it is kind of a, a, a risk benefit ratio, both economically, mentally, and, um, you know, from a, a risk of harm from, you know, you can only get so many CT scans before, um, you know, they catch up with you. Professor D'Amato, do you want to add? Yes, uh, I have seen patients get totally the wrong advice from medical oncologists who have uh, little or no experience with uh, uveal melanoma. And so I encourage all my patients to see our specialist uh, medical oncologist with lots of experience in uveal melanoma at least once. And then that, if it's too far for them to travel to London or Oxford, then they can, at least our oncologists will advise their oncologist um, how screening should be done. I agree. I, I use the, uh, the, you know, the team analogy with my patients that, you know, um, you have different quarterbacks for different parts of their, um, their care. So as the ocular oncologist, we can kind of quarterback the care for their eyes, but we also work closely with um, the medical oncologist to at least set the plan. And as you said, sometimes it's too far to come back, even in the U.S., um, but their local, um, their local physicians or the local oncologists can usually comply with getting the, the test done. This adds uh, another question that came up. Um, so are ultra, and, and Brian, you touched on this, are ultrasounds of the liver just as effective as an MRI or CT to detect metastatic ocular melanoma? And um, we're gonna get two, two opinions on this. So we'll start with Brian first. What do you think? Well, I think it's a, it's a very useful tool, and it's useful in skinny people. Um, sometimes Not there like are COVID weight gain body. Right, habits. there may be an influence, but there okay. are some technical limitations depending on the body habitus and things like that. So there, you have to consider um, that when when recommending them. And then the other thing is that yes, it's maybe not as sensitive as the other chosen and preferred um, modalities. However, if they see something questionable, then it warrants further investigation with an MRI. So both from an insurance standpoint and from a um, uh, uh, detection standpoint, you know, if you see something that you, d you didn't see on the last ultrasound, uh, then maybe it deserves uh, a legitimate uh, MRI. And so that's kind of how I use it as a, as a screening in the low-risk patients to say, all right, if we see something that we're not quite sure of, then we're going to go get a real MRI. Or better Professor screen. Otto, you've, worked, you've uh, practiced both in the U.S. and also in, uh, in Europe. Um, how, how does that differ in terms of, you know, there was a lot, I remember in the U.K., ultrasounds of the liver were kind of standard of care. Um, has that changed? And what is your opinion having seen both mo all these modalities? In the UK, uh, the standard of care was ultrasound because it was unaffordable for our National Health Service to pay for MRIs for everybody. And then I, once I started um, genetic testing and identifying high-risk patients, then we were able to do MRIs on the high-risk patients and the government paid for that. So the genetic testing made a big difference there. What, uh, as we're still talking about screening, um, if you were to pick the best screening modality, PET scan, CT scan, um, MRI, and let's say these are the best machines in the world and the best radiologists reading them, um, is, is there a real significant difference between these in detecting disease at the time of diagnosis and also say every, you know, at, at subsequent follow-ups. Bertel, why don't you start with that one? Well, actually, I don't do uh, systemic screening at the time of diagnosis of the ocular tumor because I do genetic testing on everyone. And then they go and see the oncologist and then the oncologist does the right. systemic screening. Okay. So before treatment of the ocular tumor, I tell patients that the chances of a false result are much greater than the chances of a true result because 
if anything is found, it's likely to be a birthmark or a cyst or anything like that. And just because the result is normal, it doesn't mean there's no micrometastases there. So unless it's a very big tumor, then I would rely on uh, genetic testing and then go on from there with regards to imaging. Ryan, if you had to pick between PET, CT, or MRI, um, what is your preference and what is the data that supports? So I think that the most sensitive test that we have available that I, we found just by experience is the MRI with a specific contrast that highlights liver tissue, like EABIS. And we use that um, to get very small lesions. And, and I think that's better because the resolution of the PET scan, the lesions have to be bigger to be discovered. And the contrast that's liver specific, now we're talking mostly the liver, um, is, is, is really highlights these small diseases or a small, small quantity of disease. So if you're looking for tiny things, I think that the MRI would probably give you a lead time bias of a couple months before the other modalities would pick them up. Um, and they're also the most expensive, unfortunately, and the most time consuming and the most contrast. So unfortunately, that's kind of been our, our experience. Um, I have one question for Bertel. When he was using the ultrasounds, um, they were fairly accurate in, in detecting things. Did you have that experience? Well, it's a long time since I've relied on ultrasounds. For the past uh, 10 years, I think it's been MRIs. Right, but They're just as, to operate. But, you know, for patients to feel comfortable that, oh, I'm not compromising myself by getting an ultrasound, when you were doing it, 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 it picked up fairly. Not as sensitive as MRI. That's for right, sure. not as sensitive, but it, it was a, a, an adequate screening method. Well, better than nothing, I suppose. <laughs> it was a big problem in Scotland, where, where in England patients were getting MRIs, and in Scotland the health service wasn't paying for that at, at some time ago. Things might have changed now. And so the patients were very upset about that, and hopefully that's changed. So, you know, our, and I've seen two different uh, medical oncology practices that specialize in melanoma take different approaches. So I'll tell you what we do here. So um, when a patient is diagnosed, uh, and you'll see it's a bit of practicality and a little bit of insurance, you know, wrangling that kind of fit into this. So if someone is diagnosed, um, you know, we will obtain uh, screening, usually with a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, only because it's probably going to get approved um, without any blinking from insurance companies, at least on the West Coast. And um, it does provide a baseline, and I can get it scheduled pretty quickly. Sometimes MRIs, depending where the patient is coming from, it just takes a while to get them scheduled. And then we take a genetic-based approach. So as uh, Professor D'Amato has helped us to understand, um, the patients that are at high risk um, then are uh, clearly followed by the uh, medical oncologist. And then I've seen a, a, a kind of a diverse array of screening plans after that. So um, a very high frequency MRI alternating with PET scan or MRI alone or PET scan alone. So I think all of these technologies are developing and depending on your institution, they just may be better at some things than others. If you have a really good ultrasound experience at that, at that institution that specializes in that, maybe ultrasound is going to be great in that, that person's hands. Um, so that's where I think knowing what your medical oncologist is comfortable with interpreting, because at the end of the day, you get a report and that report guides. Um, so I think that's another aspect of this. So the other thing that Bertel brought up, which I thought was really important, is the false negatives, meaning that something shows up on the scan that is there and it's real. We wrote a paper probably maybe eight years ago on the routine result, the, the results of uh, false negatives in um, patients screened for uveal melanoma. And 50% of the time, there was something in the liver. 
Now, it wasn't metastatic disease. It was usually a cyst or hemangioma, which are benign and very common, but the general public now has access to their scans before the doctors review it, and they see things in their liver, and there's a moment of panic and terror that happens. And I think it's important to know that you know most livers have things that are not uh, routine and normal livers are very few and far between. And it doesn't mean you have uh, metastatic disease. And uh, that can be very challenging for patients because they get, they get to read their scans and before they're interpreted sometimes, and they'll mention these lesions and, and you know, the amount of anxiety that it causes is, is terrible. Um, and so I just think it's important for people to know that these, you know, normal variations of normal are there and that they need to be interpreted. And um, it's just important. False negatives can be very terrifying. I'd like to speak about um, this emotional aspect. Um, but there are some ophthalmologists and even oncologists say, what's the point of screening for metastatic disease if there isn't any treatment? Well, first of all, uh, there is treatment, and uh, it's in some patients it's quite effective, and we're never going to get any progress unless we have a chance of detecting these metastases at the, when when it's early enough for some form of treatment. I remember the bad old days when metastases were detected just a very few weeks before the patient was terminally ill. Now that's changed enormously. There's, there's a long time and lots of more opportunities for treatment. The second uh, advantage of um, screening is psychological. I've learned from my patients that when a patient gets a, a normal screening test, they know, even if they've got monosomy three or, or class two gene expression profile, they know that they're gonna have good health for the foreseeable future. And that helps them to, to put things out of their mind and to enjoy life a bit more than if they're in total uncertainty. No, I think that the, the screening has a really um, big and really unrecognized psychological effect. Um, you know, all my patients will be terrified the day that they come in on the review of the MRI date. And uh, they, they say that. and. The relief and posture change and and emotions that happen after that result it's just it's just hard and you do that for 10 years or 15 years it wears um, and it's hard so i you know i think any way that we can make that easier for them it's it's better one of our uh, respondents uh uh echoes this uh terror when i was told about spots before i saw oncologist turned out to probably be cysts so I think that that's uh, completely true. These are fine tooth combs that are running through our bodies and you're gonna find something, um, you know, if you've never checked before. So I think that's good. Um, this is really bringing up a lot of uh, questions, um, you know, uh, as we go forward. Um, uh, Brian, again, if you didn't get an MRI, um, what would be the next test that you would get if you couldn't get an MRI? CT scans. CT scans. Uh, and yeah. for, the, for the stuff that you mentioned, I think that that's it. But, you know, when we start to get past 10 years, then, you know, that's when I start to, to explore ultrasound. Yeah. And, and I, I, I totally agree with that. I think at, at, at that point, your, uh, re, your return on development, especially if you know it's a low genetic risk um, tumor, is probably very low. And I think ultrasound is there's no radiation and it's not terribly expensive and it's pretty quick. Um, some patients just don't want to know. They're like, I've done my duty for 10 years and gotten the scans. I'm done, doc. And, you know, at that point, it's a conversation as long as they understand and still follow up with their general health checkups and, you know, can still be followed. Then that's at that point, I respect the patient's decision. Um, but for some, they're ready to stop after year one. And that's where I think that becomes different. So let's get to um, a more specific questions. Um, let's say I'm a class two patient, um, a class two melanoma or a monosomy three um, melanoma patient. Um, is there standard of care for how those uh, that patient should be screened? Brian? So that's where having a, a medical oncologist that's pretty top of their game in uveal melanoma is important. 
And I think that that is where I defer my habits to um, Dr. Carvajal because um, you know he he is much more aggressive than I am. Typically, what I would do in the past is is uh, screen them once or twice a year. Um, but I have a feeling now, and with the more data, that Rich uh, actually likes to do it every four months in certain cases, depending on the size of the tumor and and the genetic profile. Uh, but I don't argue with him, uh, and so you know, at Maybe minimal, because. let's say if he said that he would do nothing, I would probably do it twice a year. Fair enough. For, uh, the, first, for the first three to five years, maybe for within the first three to five years, and then I would go to yearly. So, Professor Demato O'Brien saying um, high risk, uh, more frequent, um, maybe even as much as every four months uh, for at least the first five years of uh, interest. How how about your practice? Well, I echo what Brian has said. In uh, San Francisco, when uh, we left everything to the oncologist there, they did exactly the same. They were doing these uh, scans every four months or so. In Britain, it's less common than that. There's le the, the scans are less frequent than that. I, I... But when I say in Britain, there's variation between London, Liverpool, so, well, so uh, yeah. something that um, that I brought up in, a, in the earlier talk this morning is the NCCN, the National um, Comprehensive Cancer Care Network, um, does have published guidelines now for screening high-risk patients. And it's not like a law, but it does provide flexibility of every, you know, for every three to six months, some range that is broad enough that um, if you have someone that is you know, in the know and follows the guidelines, it may provide backup for patients to get that covered from insurance. So here, that would be a big problem if suddenly, you know, my doctor says I have to do it every four months, but I get dropped a $10,000 or $20,000 bill to comply. Um, so hopefully this helps. So I think that we're all, to answer the question from the audience, it sounds like we're all in alignment that class two patients really need to be followed by medical oncologists that understand ocular melanoma or at least can coordinate that care, um, more frequent rather than less frequent, higher resolution rather than lower resolution. Um, I think, uh, is that a consensus, gentlemen? I think it's changed, right? Because of what Bertel mentioned earlier, that the treatments and availability of clinical trials and everything, um, you know, before when we had nothing to do and the treatment was dismal, it didn't make much sense to screen regularly, right? All that you knew is that you had disease early and the treatment was still dismal. But nowadays, you know, if you catch something early and you can enter a clinical trial and you respond well, then then you have five extra trials that you can try, um, you know, and you have the time to really find something that works for you. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why there's been a shift to more frequently uh, frequent scanning because again, we have more options and it gives us more time to exercise those options. I think that, um, that screening for metastatic disease depends so much on prognostication that we must all be doing everything we can to enhance the accuracy of our prognostication. And there's lots of research in that field and that really needs to keep going and to expand. So um, another question from the audience, can ocular melanoma patients donate organs or donate blood? No. Ryan says no. Professor? To be on the safe side, I'd say so no. So that's what I recommend as well. And I think um, if you go to the, uh, the blood banks uh, to donate, one of the screening questions isn't whether I have lung cancer or breast cancer. They ask, do you have cancer? And they'll ask specifically for melanoma. And I think the concern, as, as um, has been alluded to, is this concept of micrometastatic disease. So individual cells that may be floating around in the blood, trying to find its way to um, some other part of the body. And therefore, um, I think the safe answer is no. I think you could help work at the blood drive in your neighborhood and help other people donate blood, and that's as important. Um, but I think uh, safety-wise, I would say no as well. Um, and 
Another comment about scanxiety. I like that word, uh, anxiety over the scans, two weeks before in the day of results. Um, it's probably a message for uh, the physicians that, you know, once, as soon as we get the results in hand, you know, getting back to the patient um, is probably uh, a, a really good idea. Um, so let's, uh, so, so some more questions. Um, here's a good one. So my general eye doctor has never dilated my eyes. Should I be upset with him or her? Brian? Well, I would say no. However, I would physically ask them to say, you know, that you would request a, a detailed look at the back of the eye if that's possible for him. And if not, may he recommend you to somebody that can do that properly. You know, some people, if you push them beyond their limits, they, they, they are not uh, accustomed to doing that kind of exam and may not do it as thoroughly as someone who does it on a regular basis. Uh, so putting, putting your regular guy who doesn't do it on the spot versus going to get a... Um, a retina specialist or something like that, if, you know, a one-time look just to, to say, hey, I did that and everything's good and I don't have anything. It's probably a good idea. I was, uh, a another comment that came in um, that points out that um, at the time of diagnosis, um, systemic, uh, systemic testing is done to help define the stage of the disease uh, in cancer. So, um, to get a scan at the time the melanoma is diagnosed, as well as ge the genetic testing, all um, gives the snapshot of where the disease is or isn't in the body. Um, I think we're all um, also saying that the likelihood of finding melanoma in other parts of the body at that initial uh, exam is uh, likely to be low, um, and it doesn't rule out that it isn't floating in the blood. But then um, we talk about surveillance, which is uh, what will happen on that subsequent follow-up. So I think there is going to be some practice um, alteration with that, as it you know, in different settings. Um, but again, uh, the NCCN is recommending that initial staging scans, and again, that's a conversation to have. Uh, right. Next question. Um, uh, I think we've touched on this. Do you recommend that patients make arrangements to have their uh, OM doctor and oncologist share that information with their general practitioner. Um, is it important for my primary care physician to know what's going on or is that too technical? Brian? I think the primary care doctor is kind of the advocate for the patient and should be informed of everything that's going on with the patient. You know, they should have the complete records of all the specialists and, and kind of really be the, the glue that holds all these specialists together. And sometimes they get neglected and you get off in your subspecialty world and they're, they have a problem that's maybe not directly related, but you know somewhat related to these diseases and even other diseases that can compound them, just like let's think about diabetic retinopathy and uh, hypertension after radiation. So those things are important. And so I think that it's really important that everybody inform their primary care doctor if they have one. And if not, they should probably get one. Professor? Yeah. Um, we always copy all letters to the primary care doctor. In fact, we consider the general practitioner, the primary care doctor, to be the conductor of the orchestra. And we are just the assistants of the primary care doctor. The specialists are assisting the primary care doctor to help to much more patient. elegant an that's analogy right. than my football analogy, but <laughs> I think that's well said. Uh, um, so uh, uh, in line with that, um, um, in terms of conjunctival melanoma, which is a little different than uveal or intraocular melanoma, um, Brian, you see a lot of this in your plastics, oculoplastics and ocular oncology practice. Um, how do you change your uh, surveillance if I have uh, resected, treated, or irradiated conjunctival melanoma? So it's, it's, a, it's a different animal, as you know, and it's more closely related to skin than uveal. So mucosal melanomas are their own animal and involve you know, other mucosal tissues throughout the body, but conjunctival are fortunate in the, in the world of mucosal melanomas to be one of the more favorable results. 
the metastatic pattern for conjunctival uh, melanoma is usually to regional lymph nodes. And then it usually likes the, the um, lungs and brain, is, which is completely different from the pattern of uveal melanoma. Or ocu oh, I can't say ocular when we're talking about conjunctival, so I'll say uveal versus conjunctival or mucosal. And so for that standpoint, all my patients, I do a digital palpation of the, the lymph nodes that are in that track, and those are the ones in front of the ear, underneath the jaw, and then in the cervical uh, neck. And then uh, depending on the type of melanoma, if it's a small limbal lesion that has a, a, rare, a small risk for um, screening uh, for metastatic disease, I may just observe them. Whereas a, a bigger, thicker tumor in the fornix or something like that, then I would do an MRI of the brain and the CT of the chest, uh, or even have a, the brain include the neck uh, to look for that uh, lymph node area. Got it. And that's, I, I will, I, I do that. The overall metastatic rate for conjunctival is about 23% or so. Uh, long term, so I think it's still important, but it's it's lower than uveal, uh, but still important. So, last question, hardest question, and we have two minutes left, uh, Professor Damato. Um, what is the standard of care for uh, treatment of ocular melanoma liver metastases? Is there a standard of care, um, and if so, what is it? I don't think there's a standard of care because the opportunities and the constraints vary so much between centers. Ideally, patients would be enrolled into a clinical trial and hopefully getting the latest techniques. But then they might be randomized to getting a, a different treatment or, or a no treatment at all. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I, I think that because there's variable results with different treatments, no one stands out uh, in a certain population above all the others, although all of them have been progressing from you know, the, the old chemotherapy that was used uh, for metastatic melanoma, even cutaneous, where the uh, efficacy was close to zero. Now we have multiple different um, pathways to uh, get this and all of them are a little bit different and their efficacy is much better than it has been so there's no one that stands out that oh everybody must get get this because the, the cancers are different in everyone we've come to the end of our hour i'll just summarize briefly screening is important working with a uh, a team that understands ocular melanoma including medical oncologists uh, is important. Uh, good communication and dialogue with your eye doctors are important. Um, and um, I'm honored to share this stage again with Professor Marr and Professor D'Amato. And uh, great question. Sorry we didn't get to them all. We'll do it again some other time. So, Brianna, back to you. Thank you, everyone.